This is a video for A-level English literature, uh, specifically political and social protest writing for AQA specification B, um, Adult House. And this video is all about showing you uh, what it means to analyse a text or to annotate a text closely in order to benefit your essay writing. Um, so I'm going to actually be looking at the end of Act 1. This is a three-act play. Um, I'm going to be looking at the end of Act 1 for this. So what I would suggest, you might want to get your text that you've been using and get ready to annotate it because, as it says in the video uh, line, um, I'm going to actually be annotating this text with you um, in real time. So it might be useful to get some pens and pencils and highlighters ready in order to appreciate how meaning is created at the end of Act 1. Um, I have been teaching Adults House now for seven years. Um, I love teaching political and social protest writing, uh, this more kind of domestic type of setting, uh, obviously about a family home in Scandinavia. Um, so just to, before we actually go into the text, Specifically, I just want to remind you that at A-level, the best essays are precise and perceptive. And perceptive is a word that AQA uses to describe um, band five writing, which is grade A, really. So the top band. I have been an examiner for AQA for many years. And in my experience, um, the, when students follow these five steps, their writing is much more confident, it's much more precise and perceptive because they are not afraid of the text, really. They're, they're diving into the text and being able to demonstrate their knowledge. So no surprises, whenever you're dealing with um, an English literature A-level, you really need to make sure that you know the text well. And this might mean you have to read the text three, four times. Um, the films can often help as well, uh, but knowing the text well means that you're going to be able to select the best bits of the text to answer your task. Uh, AQA calls this textual episodes. Um, you do not need to analyse and you should not analyse text in a broad or generalised way. What that means is to, to be, I suppose, scanning through the text generally it's far better to zoom into specific sections of the text and then make sure that you're linking these sections to your question or your task to show that you're answering the question. One of the quickest ways to lose marks for A-level English is to actually not answer the question. So you must make sure that you know the text well enough in order to zoom into specific bits of it to analyse AO2, the meanings, the dramatic or authorial methods. It's worth bearing in mind that AQA know that they have given you so long for, a, for an essay. It could be between 50 minutes to an hour. That's not a lot of time. And they know that. And I often find that students give themselves too much to do in the time. You know, you are within your right, if you wanted to, to write about just one bit of the text. You don't have to talk about every single act or every single scene or every single chapter or every single stanza in a poem. It doesn't say that anywhere, and I'm not sure where students get that from. It's far better to be specific and precise in answering the question than, than roam around the text in a generalised way because you think you have to talk about everything. You don't. Even PhD students can't talk about everything in their 100,000 word thesis. So please don't give yourself too much to do. It's better to be specific and talk about one or two sections than, you know, 10 or 20. For literature spec B, uh, you, don't, you do not need to write introductions or conclusions for essays either. And the exam board has advised, as I advise my students, that it's far better, rather than wasting time writing an introduction, which can be a little bit waffly and a little bit woolly, to actually go straight into your first paragraph and begin to actually analyse the extract or the text itself. So please don't spend lots of time on introductions and conclusions. They are notoriously difficult to write, but they also, uh, students often find it very difficult to get any marks from them at all because they are just basically an overview. So I would really encourage students to go straight into the first paragraph and begin to analyse the texts. For the 
political and social protest writing exam, Adol's House is obviously open book. And open book exams can be nice because it gives you, a, I suppose, a sense of security. But it can also encourage off task behaviour in the sense that you spend too long trying to find quotes and flicking through the pages rather than actually writing. So also, even though it's nice that you perhaps have an open book exam, some students don't actually like them because their word with it actually becomes a distraction. So please avoid uh, flicking through your books. Uh, for long periods of time. You should know the text well enough to be able to find your quotes quickly rather than spending ages in the exam trying to find the correct page. OK, so that's just my experience as an examiner for AQA, uh, that students must be precise and perceptive because the time is ticking. You need to demonstrate knowledge of the text, but also obviously how it links to the genre. In this case, polit political and social protest writing. But also be specific. Don't spend ages talking about lots of different bits of the text. Be precise and zoom into it and talk about one piece of the text in a lot of detail. So, as I said at the beginning, the, this video is all about the end of Act 1 um, because there's lots of useful information and lots of useful things to analyse in A Doll's House at the end of Act 1 uh, when Halma and Nora are left on stage discussing. Um, things. Um, just to recap then, and hopefully this isn't alien to you, you, you know what I'm talking about here. The audience by this point has already been made aware that Nora has uh, taken out a loan from Krodstad. Uh, she told Mrs Lind about it and Krodstad has recently just left the house uh, in, in order to kind of uh, set up this blackmail of Nora. So we know as an audience what's happened here. Um, we also know that Halmer, the husband, Torvald Halmer, is a Mandarin by notions of respectability, as was common at the time. So this is 1875. This is Victorian era. We know that particularly men were driven by notions of respectability, partly of which comes from the ability to have employment and gain respectability from having a decent job and bringing in the money, but also partly on a social element in order to have a wife uh, who takes care of the home and the children. So common aspects of, I suppose, patriarchy here, the idea that a, a man's reputation is enhanced if he is married with a doting, um, domesticated wife who does all the, the home stuff. Um, in this section, uh, what is being discussed by Halma and Nora is the idea of morality, is the idea of moral character, and there is a particular semantic field used throughout this play, but it really is foregrounded in this section, which is why I think it's a useful uh, part of the play to analyse in detail. Because um, Halma does not know what he is saying is actually criticising his own wife, there is a high degree of dramatic irony. He basically comes in and says that people that lie have corrupt behaviour, they have corrupt morality, they um, distort and they destroy the atmosphere of a home. What he doesn't realise, though, is by saying this, he's actually criticising his own wife. Although at this point, he doesn't actually know what she's done. But we know as an audience. So that dramatic irony enhances this sense of tension and this feeling of oppression that Nora begins to have by this point. Um, and that's why you will often see pictures of a doll's houses and uh, birds in cages for this play, because it's this idea of entrapment and claustrophobia. So when we are going to begin analysing this extract in a second, we need to look at this from two angles. We need to look at it from a language or a linguistic point of view, which is obviously an English specialism. But because this is also a drama, we also need to appreciate the stagecraft and the logistical staging decisions that a drama specialist will also be familiar with. There is often a debate uh, who is better to teach drama texts? Is it drama teachers? Is it English teachers? I would argue it's a bit of both. I prefer a hybrid model. So when I, even though my specialism is in English, I often have to um, appreciate the stagecraft and the logistics of a play in order to help students find meanings. So actually, I believe it's a mixture of English and drama uh, coming together to help us understand how meaning is created from the text. 
So from this point on, if you haven't already, I would suggest get your text ready, um, get a highlighter and get a pen, because we're now going to start to analyse the end of Act 1 uh, together. And hopefully this will be beneficial in terms of AO2, uh, which is um, dramatic methods, used to be called language and structure. So go and get correct stationery and then we'll make a start in analysing the end of Act 1. OK, so here we have um, a section of the end of Act 1. And you can notice here that the stage directions are just as important as what the characters say, because that the stage directions often tell us about body language. They tell us about stage positioning. They can also tell us contextual details. Uh, many of you will know that A Doll's House is actually set around Christmas time, and that's obviously no coincidence. That has been a deliberate choice by Ibsen to do so. So the first thing that we get told here is Nora is beginning to dress the tree. Um, and she, as she's busying herself in the uh, room, because she's on her own in this point, she says a candle here and flowers here. The horrible man, he's obviously, she's obviously referring to Krodstad here. It's all nonsense. There's nothing wrong. The tree shall be splendid. I will do everything I can think of to please you, Torvald. I will sing for you, dance for you. So as we know from Helm, uh, from Nora, sorry, at this point, she's talking in a very erratic way. Uh, and that typifies this kind of mood that, sh that is beginning to materialise in this play, which is a mood which is full of paranoia almost and quite a, kind of almost kind of emotional crisis at the moment. And that's represented because of the sentence types. So short, we can say short sentences here. She's quite erratic. Uh, she's having some kind of emotional crisis. Um, but notice as well in this green section, we've got a lot of exclamative sentences as well, showing that, that erratic emotional uh, side to her. Uh, she's full of panic, but she's also full of paranoia. Um, and she is clearly somebody who is, who is concerned uh, about the situation and about what might happen if Crosstad gets his way regarding this money. Notice as well, she, she says, I will sing for you, dance for you. It's all about being almost like a puppet. She's almost performing a role here. Um, and that links very nicely to the title of the, um, of the play, clearly, this idea of the doll. Um, so you can see from a very small amount of green text here, we're starting to squeeze out all of the meaning. I also want to say about the, um, the tree here, obviously, that this is all to do with facade and appearances which links to the home, um, the idea of this immaculate middle class home, which doesn't little really to reveal the realities of what's happening inside um, and the realities of the secrecy and how their marriage is beginning to fracture because of the um, how secrets have, have been allowed to erupt between them. Um, so already we're starting to see some important information here to do with meanings. Um, one of the first things that Helmer asks when he comes back in from his office, I think, or from outside at least, from outside the room, is he asks in this interrogative, has anybody been here? And because we have watched the front room, we know that Krogstad has, so somebody has been here. But look what Nora says, she says no, um, so she lies. And that shows again um, that there is this secrecy coming through. Um, she is not being honest. And, and she's um, lying. And that lie shows, again, how their relationship, their marriage is beginning to um, become quite fractured and, and, and distorted. Uh, notice as well that she asks a question and then immediately answers it. That's called hypophora. It's a type of questioning technique. When you use hypophora, it means you answer your own question straight away. And that's what she's done here. Uh, because she wants to shut this conversation down. She's kind of obviously very erratic. She she knows that she's lying, so she wants to shut the conversation down and change the topic um, of the conversation uh, because she doesn't want um, Halma to be um, asking lots of questions. Um, and then what happens is... Um, she kind of gets caught out in her own lie because he says, that's strange. I saw Crosstad going out of the gate. Did uh, So immediately he kind of says, are you sure? <laughs> and Nora says, did you? Oh, yes, I completely forgot. Crosstad was here for a moment. So kind of cringy uh, here. She has to kind of um, admit 
um, that she was lying before. So she has to, she was caught out in her own lie there. Um, again, it's, I suppose it's how do we see Halma here? Um, how is Halma presented? Halma is quite an interesting character because some students will say, well, he's domineering, he is patronising, he is uh, possessive. And then some people will actually feel sorry for him because actually compared to behaviour that he might, he could be demonstrating, he's not that bad. He's not that evil. Um, I suppose that's a contextual thing regarding how our reactions change over time. Uh, but some people find Halma quite a sympathetic character, particularly at the end of the play, at the end of Act 3. So here, obviously, she has been caught out by her own, uh, by her own lie. Um, as we go down a little bit more, um, they begin to talk about um, Halma tries to suggest that he knows what's going on. He believes that Crosshead has come round trying to get Nora to do his dirty work, basically. Um, did he beg of you? Yes, Torvald, but Nora, Nora, and you would be a party to that sort of thing, to have any talk with a man like that and give him any sort of promise and to tell me a lie into the bargain. So, again, lots of repetition of interrogatives here. Um, Sentence types, I often say to students, are incredibly important because it tells us how the character is supposed to be conveyed to us. Um, so, again, you could see um, uh, how is quite domineering here is quite prominent, perhaps in this conversation because of these lots of um, interrogatives. Notice he also uses the determiner, a man like that. Um, he doesn't even say what that means. But obviously that suggests some kind of corruption, um, some kind of um, Ill illegal activity, something um, that isn't perfect, um, so, uh, so imperfect behaviour. So he's really using Krogstad as, as a vehicle to, you know, what will become kind of a lecture of morality and a lecture of, of proper behaviour and expectations of behaviour at the time. Then we have a section here where Nora says, lie. Didn't you tell me no one had been here? And then the stage direction shakes his finger at her. So this is almost like a parent-child relationship um, that kind of is reminiscent of their marriage at the beginning. Uh, shaking of the finger, forbidding her from eating sweets or macaroons, all of these things suggest that this isn't really what you might now call a husband and wife relationship. There's, there's a degree of inequality or asymmetry between them in their relationship despite being married for eight years. Um, the wagging of the finger obviously is is quite, could argue quite draconian, um, quite dystopian maybe, uh, that despite being married to this man uh, there is clearly an imbalance there in their relationship. And the final thing that we can say here in this green section is this idea of, um, again, that possessive determiner, my little songbird, um, suggesting, obviously, possession. And he will often use lots of zoomorphisms as well um, in this play. A zoomorphism is when you compare uh, a person to an animal. And I often say with my students that the animals that he chooses to compare her to are things like mice and birds, things that are quite small, but also have connotations of beauty, but also vulnerability. So he says here, my little songbird. Now, on the one hand, you could view that as being quite affectionate, perhaps. But on the other, you could also view that as being very kind of patronising and also quite oppressive as well. So again, for AO5, ask yourself if you would like to be called a songbird by your partner. Uh, if you wouldn't, chances are you would view this as quite oppressive and also a little bit kind of um, uncomfortable, I suppose. So you can see here in our in our annotations down the side that from a very short amount of text, we can actually create lots of connotations, lots of meanings, lots of ways in which meaning is conveyed by the playwright as to the dynamic between these two characters. OK, going forward a little bit more into at the end of Act 1, so there's a little bit of a gap and then I took the text more from the end um, because they continue this discussion. So Krogstad, who is 
the antagonist of the play. He represents the, the disharmony to the home. Uh, he's kind of like an outside threat to the marriage. Uh, the cross tie has been used here as a springboard by Halma particularly to talk about morality and to talk about respectability and um, I suppose corrupt moral behaviour which can manifest itself into um, kind of unpleasant feelings of the home like lies and things. Notice um, Obviously, one of the things that Ibsen says when he wrote this play, Ibsen said himself that a woman cannot be herself in modern society. So here you have the double standards um, between men and women, because notice how um, Halma says many a man. Um, but by this point, we know that dramatic irony, we know that actually Nora has done the same thing. Um, and obviously Nora as a woman, um, has also acted uh, wrongly, arguably, that is, of course. So what the conversation turns to here is Nora trying to find out what Halma's view is of people who do the wrong thing. Uh, and it's, it's disguised through a discussion of what men do or have done. But obviously, from a from an audience perspective, we know that Nora has also done the same thing as Crosstad, which is have some kind of illegality, some kind of taboo. So Halma says many a man has been able to retrieve his character only though if he openly confessed his fault and taken his punishment. So obviously at this point, Nora has not openly confessed, to use that word, what she has done regarding the loan. Um, and that, I suppose, is, is makes it worse because she hasn't been open about it. She has concealed it and it has enabled secrets and lies to begin to to begin to erupt in the home. So you have this juxtaposition between this immaculately looking middle class home at Christmas and also how the marriage is beginning to disintegrate into secrets and lies and paranoia. Obviously, Halma at the moment is oblivious to this, um, but it obviously all comes out later. Um, Nora, notice here, and I've I've kind of coloured this all the same in the pink lines here. Look at the asymmetry in, in who is talking, who isn't. Nora hardly says anything in this section. And what she does say are all questions. So I'm going to say here, um, there's, a, there's a high degree of asymmetry between who is speaking. Remember, dramatic methods can be who is dominating the conversation and who is almost speechless. Um, so Nora isn't really talking at all here. And when she does talk, she's asking questions or interrogatives, trying to learn about Halma's reaction to what happens when somebody commits something wrong or commits a crime. Notice as well, um, Halma interrupts her and interruptions in spoken language um, obviously show a degree of power and dominance in the conversation. So interruptions in, in plays are also something else to look out for. So there is a high degree of asymmetry between the amount Nora says and the amount Halma says, meaning that Halma here is dominating the conversation. Halma says, but Crosstad did nothing of that sort. He got himself out of it by a cunning trick, and that is why he has gone under altogether. But do you think it would? Just think how guilty... Uh, a man like that has to lie and play the hypocrite with everyone, how he has to wear a mask. That is quite a key contextual point here about wearing a mask, because from from Victorian, uh, from a Victorian point of view, AO3, so, so social and historical context, this is about respectability um, and about facades and about the open, you know, the, the, the appearance of keeping good manners. Um, of good manners and respectability. Uh, many of you might have studied the importance of being earnest for comedy. It's virtually the same thing about the shallow mask of manners and how you have to hide really behind um, a facade. And that links obviously to the home because the doll's house itself is also a facade. Um, it's also about um, appearances rather than the realities of what's inside. Um, again,
again, the dramatic irony here is very strong um, because Halmer doesn't know here that he's actually criticising his own wife. If he knew that Nora had done what she had done with the loan, chances are he would attribute a lot of this behaviour to her. Uh, obviously, Nora also is very close to those near and dear to her. Um, and she's also kind of inviting the children into this lie because a few pages before this, she said to the kids, uh, don't tell daddy that Crosshead has come, uh, keep it to yourself. So she's almost made the children complicit as well into this lie about Crosstad being in the home and this loan. So the irony here, um, Nora is also being criticised by Halma. And obviously Halma represents the elite because of his gender, the patriarchy. So indirectly, he's also criticising Nora here, which creates the tension and kind of this, this feeling of, of claustrophobia in this home. Um, the idea of, of Nora almost being like a trapped animal. Notice as well, again, she just simply asks how. So very short um, questions here. She's really intrigued. She's also quite voiceless, you could argue, and voicelessness is, a, is an AO4 aspect for political and social protest writing. So she is also rendered speechless. And then we get this semantic field, which I often find with students is so key to understanding this part of the play. The semantic field to do with um, to do with illness and disease and decay and kind of decomposition is quite consistent actually um, throughout the whole of the of the play, because it's to do with this discussion about morality and. The character of Dr. Rank um, has this spine disability, disability of the spine. Um, so Dr. Rank is also used as a character to discuss this idea of morality through disease. Obviously here, metaphorically, uh, what Halmer is saying is people that lie um, infect the home. Uh, people that lie infect the harmony of the home. Um, and what he doesn't realise is that he's actually criticising Nora because that's what she's doing. Uh, she's also lied, she's covered up the truth, and therefore, um, from Halmer's point of view at least, um, she is also, to some extent, sabotaging this harmony of this middle class home. And again, you've got there the, the phrase germs of evil, which is quite strong language here, but again links to that semantic field of germs and decay and, and a lack of cleanliness. And again, she finishes by asking another question. Are you sure of that? Just trying to make sure, you know, you know what he's saying. Is it logical? Does it make sense? And in the end, as we know, she actually believes it because um, she believes what he's saying is some kind of true statement. And as we know, after this, uh, she doesn't actually play with the children again. She separates herself from her three children as a way to protect them. And again, this is also interesting because some students will say she's a bad mother because she neglects them. She only focuses on herself. But on the other hand, students will say that she's protecting the children because she's protecting them from her own deceit. And if it's true what Halmer is saying, that lies do infect the children and ruin their innocence, then you could argue that she's doing something quite noble and heroic by sacrificing her own role as a mother in order to protect them from this kind of morality and this corruption of morality and respectability. So again, another section there where we've really zoomed into the text and thought about the meanings and what Ibsen is, is conveying to us in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, the language and the staging. As we go into the next section, he starts talking about a lawyer. Now, he used to be a lawyer. He's now, I think, a bank manager somebody quite high up in the bank that he works in. But before that, he was a lawyer. And what he's doing here is he's basically saying that because I'm a lawyer, give some credibility on these issues. Uh, he's using his own experience to basically say he's right. Um, I know what I'm talking about is what he's saying because I was a lawyer. So Nora is listening to this and saying, oh my God, it must be true then because he's speaking from a position of credibility. Uh, enhancing his own uh, position or opinion on this situation. 
And then we get the double standards here coming through. Um, almost everyone he says who has gone to the bad, uh, gone to bad early in life has had a deceitful mother. So double standards. Uh, mothers seem to be criticised more than fathers here. Uh, mothers are worse than fathers. Um, so again, it's showing that I suppose uh, you know the double standards regarding sex and gender here, almost as if mothers are worse if they are liars than if fathers are. And it's part of Ibsen's way of critiquing, I suppose, uh, society at the time. And Nora questions this, another interrogative. Um, so you could argue that she's actually been quite courageous here um, in constantly kind of asking her husband these kind of questions, because there might come a point when he actually says, well, why are you asking me all this? Have you got some hive? Um, so you could argue that by asking all of these questions, she's been quite courageous. But it's also a way in which this play debates, obviously, those double standards in, in how women are perceived and treated compared to men. So the fact that she's constantly asking questions means that Halma has to keep explaining. But notice as well here that how much Halma speaks compared to how much Nora speaks. There's a huge disparity between who speaks and, who's, and who doesn't in terms of um, who speaks and who's quiet. Um, and who is quiet. So that shows again that imbalance. We've got that word poisoning coming through the verb poisoning again, suggesting again the semantic field to do with decay and illness um, coming through. You've got lies and dissimulation, lost all moral character. So again, this is a discussion about morality uh, and a discussion of respectability. Um, but it's, it's hidden within this critique of Krostad when actually Halma doesn't realise he's actually criticising his own wife. So what he's basically saying is that Nora is also poisoning the home. She's poisoning the children. She's bringing in lies and deceit into the home and she's lost all moral character as well. So audience aware Halma is um, indirectly attacking Nora. He just doesn't know it yet. <clears throat> Obviously, as an audience, we know it. And that makes us feel a little bit more superior because we know more than a character on the stage. Then we have the adjective sweet and little. Again, very similar to the zoomorphisms we we're talking about before. You know, connotations here of, uh, of being quite small and vulnerable, um, but also attractive. This is, you know, uh, uh, almost the male gaze in a way viewing the wife from the perspective of the husband as this kind of thing to be saved. And we also know from later on in the play, after they come home from the ball, um, that Halma says his fantasy is to rescue Nora. He's like this knight in shining armour, apparently. So it enhances his own sense of masculinity. So he's creating Nora as the, almost this kind of vulnerable creature to be saved. I've highlighted this bit in uh, grey here because it shows us that Nora is very uncomfortable because um, Palma goes to get her hand and she doesn't give her hand straight away. So she's kind of resistant to him, uh, to his commands. Um, she's quite uncomfortable. She's obviously quite paranoid and alarmed. Um, so she isn't particularly interested in, in being this kind of attractive, endearing wife to him at the moment because she's got other things on her mind. And the fact that she doesn't give her hand across to him straight away suggests that she is feeling a little bit, um, I suppose, suppressed or trapped in this house. And again, we've got that semantic field physically ill uh, coming through to do with illness and decay again. Again, what he doesn't realise, though, is that Ironically, despite just asking for her hand and, and holding her hand, suggesting some kind of um, closeness and intimacy, uh, he then says that when he's close to people that lie, he feels physically ill. Well, that must mean then he, if he knew the truth, would feel physically ill because of Nora's presence to him. Again, he doesn't know it, though, at this point. So, again, the dramatic irony um, creates a, a, a big amount of um, unease here and a big uh, amount of almost disequilibrium and disharmony between this happy couple. This kind of lies and this secrecy are beginning to corrupt the family home 
but also their marriage within the home as well. And then that's probably the reason why she takes her hand out of his. Uh, so she separates herself physically um, and she goes and starts to decorate the Christmas tree as a, as a way to kind of distract herself. Um, so the body language suggests that she's kind of keeping a distance from him. Um, maybe she believes that it's true that if uh, you are around people who lie, it does make you physically ill. So maybe she's in a way separating herself from that but also the fact that she um, has started to decorate the Christmas tree and textually obviously Christmas is a time of family togetherness a time where we mostly spend at home uh, Christmas is also known as the festival of the home uh, it's, it's not really called that much anymore but obviously it's no coincidence that this is really a play about relationships in the home and yet the home is falling apart at this time of togetherness and intimacy and coziness. Um, the Christmas tree obviously has been decorated um, and that is to do again with facades and appearances. Um, and you could link that to how um, Calma is going to choose her costume for the parentella at the end. This idea of dressing something up to make something look better, you could argue is also uh, foreshadowing the, the Tarantella ball at the end where he chooses her costume um, uh, later on. Um, so there's quite a bit there to do with context as well as staging. She mentions how hot it is, that declarative sentence, and obviously it might be hot literally, um, but it also for obviously figuratively is to do with the knees and the, the claustrophobia uh, that she is experiencing because she's so uncomfortable and she's so kind of uh, trapped almost, this feeling of entrapment in the room. And it's worth bearing in mind that pretty much 99% of this play does take place in this one room. And Nora is really the only character in that room. So that's the reason why you see lots of imagery and symbolism in posters for the play, for example, to do with women being kind of kept in a cage. It's, it's to show that sense of entrapment. Then he mentions the costume. Obviously, again, this links to the Christmas tree um, to do with dressing something up um, to make it look better. Uh, so it's again to do with that, that illusion. Um, again, some students say, well, that's removing her independence from her that she can't even choose what to wear. Some also argue though that it's part of this almost doll-like um, act that she's had over the years that she's been married where she's she almost at the beginning relishes in being subservient, she relishes in being kind of a victim or a child really allowing Halma to have all the power in this relationship because that might be what society says should happen. Um, the tree and obviously the costume are both momentary, they're both temporary, um, they're transient. So she's not going to be in that costume forever. And the Christmas tree is not going to stay around forever either, because as we know, soon after Christmas, we take the decorations down. So that is to do with this idea of time counting down. Um, and that links to the end of Act 2, where she talks about having so many hours to live, I think, and the idea of that sense of tension is building and building and building because the clock is ticking. She only has so long to go until she um, has to make a decision. I'm deliberately being kind of coy regarding spoilers because um, I don't want to give anything away about the ending. And then we've got the, uh, you could talk about here, the proxemics or, or the body language here of um, the staging about putting the hand on the head Again, it's quite, you could argue, quite either affectionate or um, domineering. It's up to you to decide. Um, I suppose it's from whose perspective you look from. And again, he uses the dimorphism, my precious little songbird. Again, again, you could view this as either patronising or just quite endearing. But then in this play, we also have lots of symbolism to do with doors and, and keys. And the doors in this play are motifs. Oops. That the play, the, the doors in this play are motifs to do with um, uh, to do with uh, kind of 
the ability of keeping somebody out but also keeping somebody in and that obviously to do is to do with this idea of being trapped and being um, kept in a place um, so here I'm going to talk about the motif of doors obviously doors being a barrier um, keeping somebody out suggesting a lack of power even though they're in their own home so again the doors and the the staging obviously allows Nora to be on her own when she's on her own she can then kind of talk to herself and that's how we see how uneasy she is and how um, emotionally fragile she is as well so hopefully what you can see here if you've been annotating along with me is that you can have a relatively short amount of text um, but be able to really zoom into it and that gives you a, a way to talk about context AO3 it gives you uh, you know the ability to talk about um, uh, things like um, AO4 aspects of the genre like oppression and voicelessness and tyranny and draconian behaviour. This is obviously a dystopian depiction of a family home. Uh, so it's a dystopia in this front room. Um, so again, we can link that here, I suppose. A dystopian depiction of married life. That's a nice phrase to use for this play. Quite domestic dystopia. Um, but you can see that, like I said at the beginning, now that we have gone through all of these um, slides, there's a lot to say. Um, and what I would encourage my students to do is rather than going through the text in a generalised fashion, trying to you know talk about bits here and there, is to choose a very clear section or textual episode and really zoom into the language and the meanings and the connotations. And that will really help you talk about dramatic methods for AO2 but also other AOs as well. Um, so hopefully that has been helpful. Um, and what I would suggest you do now is, is look at other bits of the text that you regard to be very important, the bits of the text that you think you would probably more likely talk about in an exam than other bits, and, and do the same for them, is, and to really kind of zoom into those bits and be able to talk about um, the relevance of, of those sections as well. If you imagine, if this is a section B essay, so paper two, section B, where you've got one task about one text, you can imagine that there's enough here by far to not really have to talk about any other part of the text. You wouldn't have to if you didn't want to. Your, your whole essay could just be a very focused analysis of this, this section as long as it answers the question. So the question might be about voicelessness, it might be about secrecy, it might be about uh, claustrophobia. Any of those aspects might be useful uh, in the uh, discussion of this section of the play. So that is what I mean by zooming in and making sure that you demonstrate a perceptive and precise knowledge of the text by zooming into particular sections of it. OK, so thank you very much for watching and uh, all the best in your studying. Thank you.